As much as I talk, you think it's easy for me to stand up here and tell you what God is doing. The beautiful thing about what God is doing in, with regards to myself is that I'm rarely there. Oh, I sit there, and I, uh, I, I usually sit back watching the young people come in, and I start saying things to myself and to the Heavenly Father. I don't know if you pray like this, but this is some of the things I say to him. Dear God, look what you have done. Just look at what you have done. And look how great it is because you've done it with a Mr. Nobody. I love the story about a guy that was uh, uh, standing on a corner and he'd walk up to people and he'd go up and introduce himself. He said, I'm Mr. Nobody. Uh, what's your name? And he'd put his hand out and they'd go, that's your name, Mr. Nobody? He said, that's, that's who I am. I'm Mr. Nobody. But I'm a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who will save anybody. <laughs> Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Now, I thought that was a very wonderful. But see, I know, I know what God does in spite of me. And the hard part is to look back and realize I have been working with young people 62 years of my life. Now, when I started out, I, I, it wasn't because I wanted to. I went to a camp up in Indiana years ago. And because I was going through a difficult time, because a, a preacher that I had to go listen to was a bigot, and my best friend was a black kid who stuttered as bad as I did when I was 12. And, and we were playing ball, and I hit the ball over his head, and it rolled up by the church, and... When he went to get the ball, the preacher came out the back door and said some pretty cruel things. And when he came back to me, and, and uh, he's my best friend, you know. And I couldn't understand the conversation, but uh, I said, what, what, I stuttered terribly, and so did he, but we bonded together. And I said, what did he say? What did he, say? he said for me to get away from the church because I'm black. Well, that hit me so hard, and I became a cynic. I began to look at this thing called Christianity. I said, oh, I get it now. Yeah, you stand up every good book, and you fool everybody, and you smile, and you make everybody impressed, but you're a, you're a hypocrite. You're a backstabbing bigot, and I began to hate this man, and my father bonded with him, so I... Uh, didn't have a good attitude toward that, that guy. But anyway, I went to a camp to show all these kids that this was all messed up. This stuff wasn't real. That was when I was 14. I came back when I was 15, did it again. And then they came to me and said, uh, Gary, you're not coming back next year. We got good news for you. You're not going to have to come back. And I said, got to you, huh? Yeah, okay, yeah. Then it hit me. These people were the only people in the world that I could trust. They were real. They were part of a rescue mission. And you don't fool people when you're working with broken lives in a rescue mission. And they were real. And I wasn't. And they said I wasn't coming back. And I said, uh, I tell you what, I'll come back and cut the grass. No, we don't need grass cutters. I, I can wash dishes. We don't need dishwashers, Gary. You're not coming back. And it hit me. I just uh, lost the best people I've ever known in my life. No matter what I threw at them, they came back with grace and love. And I told them, I said, you throw me away. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I I've tested you guys. You passed the test. You, the, the worse I've been, the greater you are. I said, I... I don't know anyone like you. And you please let me come back. I'll, I'll try. I'll do better. I promise. And they said to me, I tell you, Gary, we're going to make you a junior counselor if you come back. I said, what's that? That's somebody who works with the adult. And we're going to give you all the troublemakers. I said, I deserve it. I came back as a junior counselor when I was 16 years old. 
and that's about 62 years ago. And I've been working with troublemakers ever since. So when I see something like uh, what went on in Kentucky, I've been there before. The guy that runs the place over there named Mark Clark, he's a real deal. He's such a grace-oriented guy. And he was up in Pennsylvania years ago, and somebody asked him, because uh, he was speaking in schools down in Kentucky, he came to this place called Camp Nathaniel. Camp Nathaniel has been in business about 80 years, but they've been working with this humongous camp, and they bring in all of these kids up there in East Kentucky from every kind of background, every kind of broken home, every kind of difficult life, and the camp gives them hope. And the schools in that area have been so impressed with the ministry of that camp that they allow the gospel to be presented when, when, when we come to speak. These are public in schools, public schools. And the amazing thing is that I've been there with him years ago, and we did about 40 schools, but not at one time. We had to kind of break it up like 20 and 20, whatever. And so I'd been up there, but now that the student body has uh, been replaced, he asked me to come back. He said, Gary, I want you to come back and give me two weeks. I said, I can't do that. He said, you have to. He said, I've got uh, thousands of young people that, that have never heard you. And uh, the, the deal is he is the one who organizes all this. And uh, he travels to these schools. I'd never find them. I'd never be able to drive. There were places where we had to pull off the road because there wasn't enough room for two vehicles. That's when I sit in the back. But anyway, uh, he gets to all these places, and we're always on time. When you get up at 5 o'clock every morning, you're, you're going to get there on time. But I can't say enough about this, this fine gentleman, this tool in God's hands. And every time I try to compliment him, man, you're the only guy I know can drive these roads and, and, and get us there. He said, I pray a lot. Every time I compliment him, he comes back with, I pray a lot. He's very genuine. He gives all the credit to the Lord. Of course, it belongs to him, right? It all belongs to him. But for me to come back, he told me, he said, I tell you, all you got to do is show up. He said, I'll set up the PA system. I'll set up. They, he sets up a flag. He sets up these other things there. And he talks about the camp, what the camp can do for other kids. But everybody knows about Camp Nathaniel. And then uh, he introduces me. And I just sit there and say every time, dear God, would you look at what you are doing? Look what you are doing. You're embarrassing me with such mercy and grace to give me this many kids to talk to. And the fact that he enables me to remember what I'm saying and the things I'm trying to quote still amazes me. But I say this to the Father all the time. Would you look at what you're doing? Would you just take a good look at what you are doing in these kids, in these lives? And the last school we did, I'm hoping I can find this. There it is. He sent me a text. The last school we did on that Friday, after the two weeks we were together, the principal of the high school sent me a text. We had only, it had been like six years since we had a program in that area because there was a controversial. Years ago, it had nothing to do with me at the time. Usually it does, but not this time. <laughs> and so they hadn't been back there. And I remember this school because 
the first time I was there, I was in this big gym, and I'm looking around, I said, there's no flag in this place? There's no flag in the gym? All of a sudden, from the ceiling, this amazing flag started coming down behind me. And the kids were saying, and I turned around and saw this amazing flag just coming right down out of the ceiling. And I said, shut my mouth. I am wrong again. I thought that was so many. You could see the flag here. Um, but he called me the, the Monday after we had left and sent me this text. I don't have any illusions about how God does what he does with this fool. But this is a perfect picture. Hello, Ranger Horton. This is Britt Lawson. I'm the principal of Harlan High School in Kentucky. You were there with us on Friday of last week. We are the school with the flag that comes down from the ceiling. I wanted, you to, I wanted to share a story with you. On Monday, the superintendent came over. First thing, this is not unusual, especially when something has gone wrong. He came in my office, shut the door, asked me who was the speaker that was at the assembly on Friday. <clears throat> I told him that it was a gentleman that Camp Nathaniel brought in. His name's Gary Horton. At this point, I became ready to defend whatever accusation that had been brought to him. He looked at me and said, well, I don't know what all he said, but I've heard it is how it was the best program that we have ever had here and how everyone needs to hear what this man has to say. I smiled and said, I'm so glad to hear this. I told him that I had <coughs> talked to my boys and they both enjoyed it, but they are a little biased and Camp Nathaniel could bring in a dancing chicken and they would sit and watch it and pay attention because... <clears throat> they love Camp Nathaniel because of the respect they have for the camp and the mission and above all for God. But that I was very excited that he had heard positive reviews as well. He told me that he had heard from several and they all said the same thing. Just thought you'd like to hear the feedback. Thanks for your service to our country and to our students. That is so rare in a school that had canceled years earlier because of the controversy. Now the guy walks in, closes the door, and gets right up to it. Who was the guy? You have no idea what these things represent in God's grace. It certainly had nothing to do with me. I'm a glove, people. That's all I am. The hand is doing amazing, marvelous, eternal things. I remember kids coming up to me during the 11,000 students that we, we reached. That's not counting the faculty and the administration. I remember one little girl came up to me. She said, it finally clicked. I said, what? Why I am so empty inside. I now have Jesus in my life. I accepted him while you were talking. And I just hugged her. And then there was a long line of kids that came up, and a lot of them said things like that. This is a very difficult place in America. But because of the testimony that goes on and on and on, God is able to keep doors open to the gospel when otherwise you'd say, not in this country anymore. Most schools in America right now, as desperate as they are, they refuse to allow the gospel to come in. So I'm praying if it happened in Kentucky, why not somewhere else? By the way, that's your job. Keep asking and believing. Because after I finished the two weeks, 
I was as fresh as when I started. And another reason is that God sent me a marvelous friend who just retired from the Airborne Rangers. He heard me in high school, what, 30 years ago? In Arizona. He came, he came to one of our camps back then in Arizona and asked me, tell me about the Rangers. And I always had the same response. Are you asking or do you really want to know? He said, I'm asking and I want to know. He joined the Army not long after that, ended up with the 82nd Airborne, went on to become a Ranger, later began to work with the Rangers in special ops, but he got the kind of discouraged, he said, and so he got out, became a patrolman back in Arizona, joined the force till 9-11. When 9-11 took place, his dear wife, who he met in the Army, uh, <clears throat> his name is Jason Wostowski. He just goes for First Sergeant Ski, because most Rangers can't say Wostowski. When 9-11 hit, his wife looked at him and said, when are we going back into the Army? He said, immediately. He went back into the Army, finished, retired as a first sergeant, went, went to raids and operations in Iraq and Afghanistan and who knows where. This guy, because of a friend he knew that we both knew in Arizona, called me up and said, Gary, get a hold of Jason. He needs to be traveling with you. Ding. I've needed a driver. I've needed a backup. I've needed someone like him. He spent the whole two weeks and made sure that I had no trouble getting in and out of the vehicle, getting into the school. He set up where I'm sitting and all the things. And we had coins, thanks to the coin guy in California. Uh, he sent boxes and boxes of coins that we handed to every student that would take one. And it said, uh, America is a land of the free only as long as it remains home of the brave. Nice shirt you had on, Rick, uh, Wednesday night. And the other side, John 3.16, which is the way I present it, for God, the greatest initiator, so love, the greatest compassion, the world, the greatest number, that he gave the greatest act, his only begotten son, the greatest gift, that whosoever, the greatest invitation, believes the greatest simplicity, in him, the greatest person, shall never perish the greatest delivery, but the greatest contrast, have the greatest certainty, everlasting life, the greatest possession. And when I, when I say the, that, I, all, I always see kids respond one way or another, whether they look down or up or whatever. The Word of God is still alive and powerful, isn't it? So Jason was my bodyguard and my guardian angel and my best friend. And every night where we stayed, we had a little Bible class. And I admire this kid's life and his wife and his two daughters. I'm just so blessed to be surrounded with people that make what I do a whole lot easier. But I've been doing this a long time. You know that. And I've been doing a long time affiliated with you. And you have made a difference. You are always there. And I'm so proud to be able to tell you that. On occasions, you have no idea what you mean to me. And when I think of Ron's faithfulness, by the way, he's right. The kids are not the problem in this country. We are the problem. And we need to change our heart and develop mercy and compassion for these kids because that's the only way we're going to get into where they live. I will never forget the first time I went to California. I, I was living in Houston, and a guy called me up and said, Man, we got all kind of wild ones out here. You want to come to California? I said, Sir, I'm not oriented to geographics. Just give me an open door, and I'll be there. So I showed up, 
after he turned it over to another guy who was a World War II ranger that I knew and loved. And anyway, uh, we went to three schools that morning. I want to, I want to give this illustration to you. It still has an impact on me after all these years. First school was an alternative school. I didn't know such things existed. But this guy who ran that school was a Vietnam vet, and he had him in a company formation. And there was a kid standing there with a rat on his shoulder. And he said, are you the speaker? I said, I'm, I'm, I'm the one. He said, follow us. I'd ask him where he got the rat, and he said, there's a bunch of them down there at 7-Eleven. Just go down and find one. <laughs> but anyway... I walked in there, and they had a company formation. He wanted me to review the troops. So I said, sure. I had to keep from laughing. You know, they, some of them looked like a Christmas tree. They had everything hanging all over them. But anyway, uh, he said, now, when I give you the command, we're going to break this thing up. You get in there, sit down, listen to this man. And they listened with phenomenal poise. Went to the second school, and the principal had his uh, feet on the desk. And he bragged. He said, our kids never flunk. We just keep them here long enough and give them a diploma. He said, they're over there in that, that, ho that uh, office over, I guess, that room. Go, go get them. So I walked in there. They were all asleep, but, but one. One was sitting with the teacher looking at a map, and the rest of them were in bean bags or sleeping bags. And the guy, here he is, man. All right, everybody, wake up, wake up. We got a program here. We got... So I shared my heart with these kids, and some of them followed me outside and thanked me. And said, man, I've been thinking about the Marine Corps. I've been thinking about the Army. Maybe that's what I need to do. They were very gracious. Then I went to a school run by an old Mississippi guy, and they were on both sides of the gym. It's a large school. And it took him two weeks to find the flags because he wanted to do, for the first time in years, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. He said they had them stuffed in some... Uh, now, some stories been off campus. I couldn't hardly find them, but I finally got a flag in here, and I told the students, stand up. We're going to, we're going to uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance. Nobody moved. No one moved. I said, get up on your feet now. We're doing the Pledge of Allegiance in honor of the program we have today. So they finally stood up reluctantly, and I was catching the flag, but beyond that, I saw about eight guys who did this. So when he introduced me, I said, I got to deal with something. I said, I saw you guys dishonor the flag with your uh, Nazi salute. I said, but after I finish, meet me outside. I have a different vocabulary that I might want to use with you. <laughs> well, they didn't meet me. But 10 other guys did. And they were a gang. And the head guy had a jacket that said, Social Distortion. And they all looked like they were all one group of heavy, uh, tough guys. The head guy came up to me first and said, My buddies and I want to thank you for this program. It's the best, best damn program we've ever had here. And we agree, man, we ought to be uh, kicking A instead of kissing. And then he looked at me and said, By the way, we dug the part about J.C. He's heavy, man. We went to the Brown Derby after that. It's supposed to be a famous place for all the Hollywood people. And the guy that initially got a hold of me walked in on the wrestler, picked up the napkin, and he said, I'll be back. And he walked out the parking lot and began to weep. I saw him walking up and down, and he'd wipe his eyes and look up to heaven and go, oh, Shake his head. I said, Al, is this guy emotional? He said, I've never seen him emotional. He finally came in, sat down with his red eyes and face, and he said, I guess now I can tell you why I brought you out here. I've been hating these kids. These ugly Americans, I disdain their appearance. And I see them every day. And I just grill, I just growl at them. I said, what a mess they are. I didn't bring you out here. For them to hear you, I brought you out here for them to reject you. And if they would have rejected you, I would have known how right I am. Now you know how low I feel. I feel so low. I've had to get out there and rebound my entire attitude because if you want to see what's wrong with the kids in this country, I look in the mirror and see me.
I've been so critical, and I was hoping they would reject your message. He said, if you'll keep coming back, I'll, I'll, I'll be a part of your, your, your logistics. Please keep coming back. And, I, and again, I, it hit me. It's not the kids are not the ones. It's us who have truth, who claim to be maturing believers. Have you been on your knees lately? Have you demanded? God said, pray according, ask according to my will. You think God wants these kids out here to hear some hope? Every time we did a school and we got back in the van, this guy, Mark, would just applaud. So, God, this is the best thing we ever did in our life. This is so good, Father. Thank you so much. Gave him an applause. I wonder what would happen if somebody did that here. We'd probably all shake up because it's not the doctrinal way. I even love the music. I love everything that's going on in this place. But if I stare at some of you, I want you to know why. You mean so much to my life. You are there. You're touching these lives. And I'm just a glove. I often just sit there and say, Lord, you got to do it again. It ain't on me. It's on you. Do it again. You send me. The mission belongs to you. Oh, God, just look at you. Look what you're doing. I am so impressed. And I will always be. Doesn't have very much to do with me. I got people sitting here right now who make a big difference in my life, who ministered with me and, and through me and uh, on our website and other things. You, you know who you are. I don't have the words to say it properly to you all. But I'm so impressed with your life and your faithfulness in spite of circumstances and I'm certainly not 100% standing up here right now, but I love you and I thank you. And before we do the Pledge of Allegiance, Colonel, I want to close in prayer. Would you join me? Father, look at you. Look what you did. Look what you have been doing. Look what you are willing to do. I am available. I, I, I will go wherever you send me. But you've got to tear down some walls, Lord. This country... And the body of Christ has become so apathetic, they don't even believe it's possible to get in schools anymore. Father, shake us up. Shake us up. Start with me and my family. And this ministry here in a transitional period, wherever you want it to, to lead and guide and direct, continue to keep your hands on Ron and Mama Jane and his most wonderful family who's here. How do I say thank you, Father? How do I say thank you 11,000 times? How do I thank you for these 62 years that you have sustained and bring glory to your wonderful son? Father, look at you. I'm so grateful, and I am so proud to call you my father forever. In Jesus' name, amen.